Chapter Thirty of the Money Moon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Money Moon, a Romance by Geoffrey Farnell. Chapter Thirty: How Anthea Gave Her Promise. And so he has really gone. Miss Priscilla sighed as she spoke and looked up from her needlework to watch Anthea, who sat biting her pen and frowning down at the blank sheet of paper before her. And so he is really gone. Who, Mister Bellew? Oh, yes, he went very early. Yes, and without any breakfast. That was his own fault," said Anthea. "And without even saying good-bye, perhaps he was in a hurry," Anthea suggested. "Oh dear me, no, my dear! I don't believe Mister Bellew was ever in a hurry in all his life." "No," said Anthea, giving her pen a vicious bite. "I don't believe he ever was. He is always so hatefully placid and deliberate." And here she bit her pen again. "Eh, my dear," exclaimed Miss Priscilla, pausing with her needle in midair. "Did you say hatefully?" "Yes, Aunt Thea. I hate him, Aunt Priscilla." "Eh, my dear." That was why I sent him away. "You sent him away?" "Yes." "But Aunt Thea, why?" Oh, Aunt Priscilla, surely you never believed in the fortune. Surely you guessed it was his money that paid back the mortgage, didn't you, Aunt? Didn't you? Well, my dear, but then he did it so very tactfully, and and I had hoped, my dear, that that I should marry him and settle the obligation that way, perhaps. Well, yes, my dear, I did hope so. Oh, I'm going to marry. Then why did you send? I'm going to marry Mister Cassilis whenever he pleases. Aunt Thea. The word was a cry, and her needlework slipped from Miss Priscilla's nerveless fingers. He asked me to write and tell him if ever I changed my mind. Oh, my dear, my dear. Cried Miss Priscilla, reaching out imploring hands. "You never mean it. You are all distraught today, tired and worn out with worry and loss of sleep. Wait, wait," repeated Anthea bitterly. "For what? To marry him? Oh, Anthea, you never mean it. Think, think what you are doing." I thought of it all last night, Aunt Priscilla, and all this morning, and I have made up my mind. You mean to write? Yes, to tell Mister Cassilis that you will marry him. Yes, but now Miss Priscilla rose, and next moment was kneeling beside Anthea's chair. Oh, my dear, she pleaded, you that I love like my own flesh and blood, don't. Oh, Anthea. Don't do what can never be undone. Don't give your youth and beauty to one who can never, never make you happy. Oh, Aunt Thea, dear Aunt Priscilla, I would rather marry one I don't love than have to live beholden all my days to a man that I hate. Now, as she spoke, though her embrace was as ready and her hands as gentle as ever, yet Miss Priscilla saw that her proud face was set and stern. So she presently rose, sighing, and taking her little crutch stick, tapped dolefully away, and left Anthea to write her letter. And now, hesitating no more, Anthea took up her pen and wrote. Surely a very short missive for a love letter. And when she had folded and sealed it, she tossed it aside, and laying her arms upon the table, hid her face with a long, shuddering sigh. In a little while, she rose and, taking up the letter, went out to find Adam. But remembering that he had gone to Cranbrook with Small Porges, she paused irresolute and then turned her steps toward the orchard. Hearing voices, she stopped again and, glancing about, espied the sergeant and Miss Priscilla. 
She had given both her hands into the sergeant's one great solitary fist, and he was looking down at her, and she was looking up at him, and upon the face of each was a great and shining joy. And seeing all this, Anthea felt herself very lonely all at once, and, turning aside, saw all things through a blur of sudden tears. She was possessed, also, of a sudden fierce loathing of the future, a horror because of the promise her letter contained. Nevertheless, she was firm, and resolute on her course, because of the pride that burned within her. So thus it was, that as the sergeant presently came striding along on his homeward way, he was suddenly aware of Miss Anthea standing before him, whereupon he halted, and, removing his hat, wished her a good afternoon. Sergeant, said she, will you do something for me? Anything you ask me, Miss Anthea, ma'am, ever and always. I want you to take this letter to Mr. Cassilis, will you? The sergeant hesitated unwontedly, turning his hat about and about in his hand. Finally he put it on, out of the way. "'Will you, sergeant?' "'Since you ask me, Miss Anthea, ma'am, I will.' "'Give it into his own hand.' "'Miss Anthea, ma'am, I will.' "'Thank you. Here it is, sergeant.' And so she turned, and was gone, leaving the sergeant staring down at the letter in his hand, and shaking his head over it. Anthea walked on hastily, never looking behind, and so— coming back to the house, threw herself down by the open window, and stared out with unseeing eyes at the roses nodding slumberous heads in the gentle breeze. So the irrevocable step was taken. She had given her promise to marry Cassilis whenever he would, and must abide by it. Too late now, any hope of retreat, she had deliberately chosen her course, and must follow it to the end. "'Begging your pardon, Miss Anthea, ma'am.' She started, and, glancing round, espied Adam. "'Oh, you startled me, Adam. What is it?' "'Begging your pardon, Miss Anthea, but is it true is Mr. Bellow be gone away for good?' "'Yes, Adam.' "'Why, then, all I can say is, as I'm sorry, ah, oh, mortal sorry I be, and my art, ma'am, my art likewise gloomy.' "'Were you so fond of him, Adam?' "'Well, Miss Anthea, considering as he were the best, good-naturedest, properest kind of gentleman as ever was, what I tell you is over and above all this, he could use his fists better than any man as ever I see, him having knocked me into a dry ditch, though, uh, to be sure, I likewise drawed his claret, begging your pardon, I'm sure, Miss Anthea, all of which happened on account of me finding him a-sleepin' in your A, ma'am. When I tell you furthermore, as he treated me ever as a man, and weren't no ways above shaking my hand, or smoking a pipe with me, sociable-like, when I tell you as he were the finest gentleman, and properest man as ever I knowed, or her tell on, why, I think as the word fond be about the size of it, Miss Anthea, ma'am. Saying which, Adam nodded several times, and bestowed an emphatic back-handed knock to the crown of his hat. "'You used to sit together very often under the big apple-tree, didn't you, Adam?' "'Ah, many a many a night, Miss Anthea. "'Did he ever tell you much of his life, Adam?' "'Why, yes, Miss Anthea. "'Told me something about his travels. "'Told me as he'd shot lions and tigers away out in India and Africa. "'Did he ever mention—' "'Well, Miss Anthea,' said he inquiringly, seeing she had paused— did he ever speak of the lady he is going to marry? Lady? repeated Adam, giving a sudden twist to his hat. Yes, the lady who lives in London. Uh, no, Miss Anthea, answered Adam, screwing his hat tighter and tighter. Why, what do you mean? I mean, as there never was no lady, Miss Anthea, neither up in London, nor nowhere else, as I ever heard on. But, oh, Adam, you you told me. Ah, for sure I told ye. But it were a lie, Miss Anthea. Leastways, it weren't the truth. You see, I were afraid as you'd refuse to take the money for the furniture, 
unless I made ye believe as he wanted it uncommon bad. So I up and told ye, as he'd bought it all, on account of him being matrimonially took with a young lady up to Lunnon. And then you went to him and warned him, told him of the story you had invented? I did, Miss Arthea. At first I thought as he were going to up and give me one for myself, but afterwards he took it very quiet, and told me as I'd done quite right, and agreed to play the game. And that's all about it, and glad I am as it be off my mind at last. And now, Miss Arthea, ma'am, seeing you're that rich, with Master Georgie's fortune, why, you can pay back for the furniture, if so be you're minded to. And I hope as you'll agree with me as I done it all for the best, Miss Anthea. Here Adam unscrewed his hat and knocked out the wrinkles against his knee, which done he glanced at Anthea. Why, what is it, Miss Anthea? Nothing, Adam. I haven't slept well lately, that's all. Ah, well, you'll be all right again now. We all shall. Now the mortgage be paid off, shall we, Miss Anthea? Yes, Adam. We had a great day over to Cranbrook, Master Georgie and me. He be in the kitchen now, with Prudence, a eatin' of bread and jam. Good night, Miss Anthea, ma'am. If you should be wanting me again, I shall be in the stables. Good night, Miss Anthea. So honest, well-meaning Adam touched his forehead with a square-ended finger and trudged away. But Anthea sat there, very still, with drooping head and vacant eyes. And so it was done. The irrevocable step had been taken. She had given her promise. So now, having chosen her course, she must follow it to the end. For in Arcadia it would seem that a promise is still a sacred thing. Now, in a while, lifting her eyes, they encountered those of the smiling cavalier above the mantel. Then, as she looked, she stretched out her arms with a sudden yearning gesture. Oh, she whispered, if I were only just a picture like you. End of chapter 30